All right, guys, we're going to go ahead and get started on this second half. So if you find your way to your seats. Um, okay, so I'm going to be specifically talking about Mwanza. Uh, during the first kind of assessment that we did there, we also did the screening, which you all heard about already. Um, well, uh, uh, and, and Avni did more of an assessment of Bugondo Medical Center. And so um, this is a map of Tanzania right here. So Bugondo Medical Center is one of only five tertiary hospitals in Tanzania. And this uh, map only shows four of them. But where we were located is right here, which is basically on the um, shores of Lake Victoria. Um, and so as you can see, basically this entire region, which is called the Lake region, um, serves as the only tertiary hospital there and its catchment area is about 16 million people. Um, and an interesting dynamic about this hospital is it's privately run and the, the staff is government salaried. And I'll talk more about the implications of that in a different slide. Um, but th there's a whole history uh, regarding this hospital just fact that it was, you know, initially privately funded and then the government's kind of subsidized uh, the workers there. And so um, the personnel that work there, so Dr. Christopher Monenzao, uh, which some of you may have met um, back when he came in December of 2000, I guess in 17, um, he is currently the only working ophthalmologist at Bugando Medical Center. So one ophthalmologist for a catchment area of 16 million people. And uh, I think I have a picture of his smiling face somewhere. It'll, it, it'll come up, hopefully. And then uh, Dr. Evarista, so she was unfortunately not there when we visited back in November, but she is uh, currently completing her pediatric ophthalmology fellowship in India right now. Um, and so she'll be joining back at Bugando Medical Center in September. And then uh, Dr. Christopher uh, actually has two uh, ophthalmologists who are just completing their residency that will be joining them um, also in September, October time. So basically, it'll grow from one ophthalmologist to four, four times the amount uh, coming this September and October. Um, they have two optometrists, which really um, at this point, when we saw them in November, this is all kind of talking about our trip in November, not the Moran outreach trip in February, but really acted more as refractionists and not really um, doing any uh, diagnosing using the slit lamp, that sort of thing. Um, and then they have two clinic nurses. And the important thing about these clinical nurses is they're not specifically ophthalmic trained and so they're general nurses and so in the operating room um, they, they aren't trained with the, um, the the ophthalmic equipment that is used for cataract surgery that Dr. Christopher does. Um, and then uh, there's two ward nurses. There's a registrar and basically what a registrar is is it's a, a basically a, a person who has completed medical school and is acting as an intern. So an intern to Dr. Chris. Um, and then there's medical school students, which is actually pretty vital because in the operating room, they are the ones that are handing the instruments to Dr. Christopher when he's operating. Uh, so a lot more stress on these medical school students than what we have here at Moran. Um, and then there's also two AMOs. Now these AMOs, uh, assistant medical officers, they are not at Bugando Medical Center. They are actually in the community of Monza. They did not complete medical school. They completed a two-year surgical training um, and uh, they perform cataract surgery out in the community. Um, so what does a week in clinic look like at Bugando Medical Center? So, um, and just to kind of belabor the point, this is back in 2018. Uh, Dr. Shah will talk more about kind of the current status because some of this has changed. But when we did our visit in November, this is what it looked like. Uh, so three days of clinic and two days of surgery. And uh, during those three days of clinic, they saw anywhere between 150 and 200 patients. Um, and uh, so, so surgery there costs a total of $140, and this is any surgery, this is a flat rate. So whether someone's getting a minor oculoplastics procedure, 
um, or they're getting cataract surgery, pterygium removal, chalazion, everything is $140, which, you know, for a middle-class Tanzanian citizen who makes about $3 per day is pretty pricey. Um, and then uh, once a week they do an outreach activity. And so what this entails is Dr. Christopher will go out into the community and he will um, have donated um, IOL lenses that uh, he will be able to use on the patients. And the patients can then have the surgery performed at Bugando for a discounted price. And these IOLs are just standard IOLs. These are not fit to this particular person. Um, so what do they have now? So there's two refraction rooms for optometrists. And so that's kind of what this picture is of. Um, there's one exam room for both doctors when Dr. Evarista returns. Right now it's just Dr. Christopher uh, with three slit lamps. Um, and that's this room right here. And then uh, they have a laser room with a Pascal, uh, two top cons and one indirect. And this Pascal and top cons, they were actually donated by an organization, a diabetic research um, department has donated uh, this Pascal and two top cons to Bugando to kind of help with diabetic screening and treatment. Um, although I'm pretty sure when they first received the Pascal, there was really no instruction given on how to use it. Um, and then they do have equipment to grind lenses, uh, but unfortunately they, as of 2018, they were not doing this. So the optometrist would refract the patients and then the patients would be sent out to the community um, private clinics to buy uh, glasses. Um, and that is that machine right here in the corner. <laughs> Um, and then uh, in terms of surgery, so there's no operating table. And so they basically use gurneys um, during the operation. The only operating room that they had at that time was shared between ob and ortho. So very busy operating room. Uh, there was no FACO, no A-scan, no IOL power calculation. So as I mentioned before, everyone uh, that gets cataract surgery or that did get cataract surgery used standard IOL measurements. Um, they had an autoclave, uh, and this is a picture of the operating room. Uh, they had an autoclave, but I don't know if you could really appreciate this. There's a piece of tape or several pieces of tape that are used to kind of keep that autoclave closed. So that obviously can become a problem. Um, and then, as I mentioned, most cataract surgeries are SICS using standard IOLs. Um, and the surgeries that they performed, um, like I said, it's mostly just the cataract and the pterygiums and some minor oculoplastic surgeries. And so, in terms of progress, um, so just to give you guys some numbers, in 2016, so this is when uh, Moran and Cornell were first visiting Bugando, this site, there were just about 27 cataract surgeries performed. And then uh, as of 2019, this year, there's already been over 400 cataract surgeries and we're just halfway through the year. Um, and a lot of this has to do with a couple of things. So back in 2016, uh, there was an older ophthalmologist that was working, really didn't operate too much. And now we have two very motivated, energetic, and kind of like just amazing ophthalmologists, uh, Dr. Uh, Christopher here and uh, Dr. Evarista, um, that are now working at Bugando. Uh, Evarista will be coming back. Um, and then also new equipment, um, which uh, Avni will talk about more. Um, and this is a picture of Dr. Ben Thomas. He actually visited, um, I, I'm not sure, I think it was last year, a couple years ago, and actually was there to teach them how to use the Pascal. So I think what they're holding up maybe is a picture of retina that they've uh, lasered, but I'm not exactly sure there what they're holding up. Um, and so I'm going to quickly go over this because I have belabored this point, sound like a broken record. So basically when we went there, we did five days of screening, screened over a thousand patients. Um, so preliminary findings in terms of, we were looking specifically at vitreo <coughs> retinal disease, my study, but um, obviously we're going to find other things. And so as you can imagine, the major causes of visual impairment in this region are cataracts, refractive error, glaucoma, AMD. 
Um, and uh, during that screening, over 50% of the patients that we actually uh, screened and examined uh, were referred back to Bogondo Medical Center Clinic for ongoing clinical care and surgery. Um, and so, say the least, we completely overwhelmed Dr. Chris with the amount of patients that we referred to him. I'm pretty sure he's probably still seen some of the patients that we referred to him. Um, okay, and so Avni is going to talk about what kind of happened back in 2019 when they came uh, with Moran. Okay, so uh, basically since that trip in November, there's been a construction of new operating rooms at Bugando that was just about starting. They were breaking ground for that when we were there in November, and it finished literally the day we landed um, in February, so that was great. There's one OR that's dedicated strictly to ophthalmology, so they now have their own room to operate in, um, and it's pretty good. Uh, they've hired another optometrist and another registrar since then. And the new optometrist is actually quite good. He's, um, he still isn't using the equipment in Bugondo to make glasses. They're working on getting some new equipment. He's making glasses outside, but he's bringing them back to the hospital and selling them in the hospital. So the hospital is making the money from those glasses, which is important. Um, and uh, the other registrar also helps take some work off of um, Dr. Mon and Sao's hands. Um, it, a lot goes into actually being able to hire more staff. So like Brad alluded to, this is a privately owned, privately managed hospital, but it is government salaried. And what that also means is that the HR is also done centrally. So if the ophthalmology department decides that they need another optometrist, they have to submit a proposal to the federal government. The federal government then decides if they think that's a good idea. They then do their own search, find their own optometrist, say, you're going to go work at Bugondo and send them there. So it's quite a process. Um, we went back in February um, with Cornell. Uh, and like I said, LICO representative came with us as well. Uh, we brought with us an, a working autoclave. They also, at the same time, got an A scan and an auto refractor so they can do IOL calculations. So we did IOL calculations for the first time and put in you know, non-standard IOLs. Um, we did provide him with an operating table and more importantly, a lot of training. So um, Dr. Christopher and some of his AMOs received surgical training. A lot of his uh, clinic nurses that were functioning as scrubs received some really good scrub training. Um, and then some CRNAs learned how to do blocks for him. He was doing all his own blocks. And then Dr. Dix Petty came with us as well and did some training with the optometrist there. So it was really a training heavy trip. Uh, these are the recommendations from LICO and the ones in italics are the ones that Christopher has already implemented. So he um, suggested a, a very different flow in the clinic to be more efficient. That is already ongoing. Um, he also wanted Christopher to be operating every day. Um, and that's a, a common theme among LICO assessments is try to do a few cases every morning. The rationale behind that is that patients that come in and are suggested to have cataract surgery, if you tell them come back next Tuesday for surgery, oftentimes you're going to miss them. The family member that's bringing them in for their appointment can't you know, miss work again in a week um, to bring them there. They might have traveled from very far and have to go back and come back. So you actually lose a lot of patients that way, whereas if you stay, stay overnight and have surgery tomorrow, um, you can get a lot of uh, a retention that way. And then just in terms of skills acquisition, um, operating every day and being able to really improve and perfect your skills by operating frequently was also part of that recommendation. So he's now operating four days a week instead of two days a week. Um, and then an in-house optical unit, so we sort of talked about that. They're, they're working on getting new um, optical equipment to start grinding their own glasses, but for now they're at least selling glasses that they make in Bugondo. Um, FACO training, more space, just because there's going to be four ophthalmologists now and it's already kind of cramped. And then a, a formal data entry system they were using, just sort of very disorganized paper charts, not really a chart, just scribbling some stuff freehand on paper. Um, and so now they're going to be using an EMR, uh, which is 
not something we started. It was something that was coming anyway. Um, so what is the future going to be in Mwanza? So, you know, they are going to expand to four ophthalmologists in September. We'll see how that transition goes. Um, hopefully do get optical an optical unit in-house. That will really help uh, bring in a lot of money for the department. Um, one, that new optometrist is going to learn an orthoptic assessment to support a barista when she comes back to do uh, pediatrics. And there's a team from KCMC that's going to be coming to work with them on that. Um, eventually, FACO training for um, Christopher or Evarista or the other ophthalmologists. Uh, a residency program would be natural there. There's a medical school already associated. There'll be four ophthalmologists at that time. And retina training for Christopher, which um, Brad's going to talk about a little bit more. Um, so uh, I think I mentioned this maybe in the presentation I talked about at Resident Alumni Day, but we basically now partnered with an organization called Retina Global. And so their main goal is to provide sustainable solutions by increasing the amount of people that can treat retinal disease. And the way that they do this essentially is that they find volunteer retina specialists uh, from around the world, really. So uh, the Americas, the EU, Middle East, whoever's really willing to go down and volunteer. And so the idea is that um, they, they, these retina specialists will go down and they'll work on very practical skills um, with Dr. Christopher and Dr. Everister, whoever's available to teach. Um, it's not, you know, this, it's, it's very focused. It's like, okay, today we're going to talk about PRP. Today we're going to be talking about injections. And so uh, basically Retina Global, and this picture right here, it's not just a random, this is Dr. Agarwal. He is the uh, president and CEO of Retina Global. So he's kind of been Avni Nye's contact and Dr. Christopher's contact and uh, trying to arrange this. Um, but the goal of this is basically that after five years, they have a five-year plan where they, they will be sending retina specialists down every two to three months to work on these specific skills. At the end of those five years, then Dr. Christopher will be able um, to go to like a truncated fellowship um, after the fifth year. So he'll, he'll already have acquired enough skills to be a fairly competent vitreoretinal um, surgeon and be able to diagnose those. So maybe he only needs six months or a year. And Retina Global will actually sponsor him to go to one of those fellowships, whether it be in the European <coughs> Union, the Middle East, or wherever it might be. I think a couple of retina specialists have been all over. Um, so they, they have uh, dedicated Mwanza as their next site. And so in September, October 1st, we're looking at the first retina specialist going. We're still kind of in the planning phases to figure out who it is exactly that's going to go. But what's really exciting in terms of Moran is uh, Dr. Calvo, CJ, I don't know if he's in here, our graduating retina fellow. Um, he has shown um, some pretty strong interest in going in March. And so he'll hopefully be going. And then Dr. Shakur as well will be going in, in this uh, summer of 2020. And Retina Global will actually sponsor them to go to teach those very specific skills. So I think uh, there's a really um, awesome, great potential for a relationship between Moran and Mwanza. Um, and it's all thanks to, I mean, Dr. Christopher is just so motivated to learn and just um, so excited about these opportunities. These are our references, and I think uh, Dr. Shaw has some pictures that she'd like to show. I just have some pictures. Uh, <laughs> so this is my outreach family during the year, Lindsay, Lori, and Talis. <laughs> Looking beautiful. <laughs> Lindsay's tape says, I can't help you. <laughs> and some friends. So that's Arwa on the left. Um, Arwa and I are both joining the same practice next year, well, in October. And um, the people that work at our practice actually thought that we were in a relationship. <laughs> and so I'm really tempted to send them a picture. <laughs> um, this is a retina fellow, Dr. Hansen, after he was roasted 
for his hair um, <laughs> at graduation. He's a little bit ashamed and going around like this now. <laughs> Brad sporting some beautiful sunglasses in Wanza. <laughs> and my landlady. <laughs> Thanks, guys.